Great. Well, I'm going to start just by sharing my screen and then we'll get Martin on. So I start, I found a picture of, of you, Brian. Um, just found it on my computer. I typed biochar in and that's what came up. <laughs> just a bit of background, everyone. This is a project where Brian and I started working together. Um, it's a bit of a Mad Max creation, but we called it Terence the Terror Predator Trailer, Carbon Negative Biomass Power Station, Traveling Teapot and Field Kitchen. Um, and it was it's just a um, a little way of show, taking it to events and showcasing the what what you can do with burning wood to charcoal, um, which is you know I've shared, uh, yeah the the sort of the inspiration of this this event and and all things biochar really the idea that like there is no such thing as waste everything is a nutrient for the soil um, and all of this surplus material um, tons of woody biomass can be turned into carbon like stable soil carbon the ultimate sort of sponge for the earth. Um, to help reverse the, um, the 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 destruction of our hydrological cycles, right? So, um, uh, yeah, and and restabilize the nutrient cycles of the earth. So, um, yeah, this this was. There's, I, th I thought I'd actually quote the Lovelock sign that we used to take around with us. James Lovelock, who passed away, of course, um, just last year, said there is one way we could save ourselves from global heating. And that is through the massive burial of charcoal. It would mean farmers turning all of their culture, all of their agricultural waste containing char that plants have spent their lives sequestering into non-biodegradable charcoal and burying it in the soil. This scheme would need no subsidy. The farmers would make a profit. So, my goodness, whilst we're waiting for everyone to join, has anyone read this book yet by um, called Soil by Mar Matthew Evans? I um I wanted to share a couple of um a couple of things I got from this book today, which just seems super relevant doing this this evening. Um, one of the one of the statements is that since humans have um since the hu you know the human population has increased these last um hundred years to to the state it is, we have lost at least half of the world's plant biomass. Half of the world's plant biomass. Um. It's also saying that we are currently losing 2.5 tons of topsoil per person per, per year, which could be more like 10 tons. And and that this is the equivalent. One study should, um, means that this is the equivalent of nine kilograms of topsoil being lost every meal that we eat, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, so I wanted to put that out there because obviously that's what we've got to change. And I think this technology and working with fungi and working with these microbes and sort of food web uh, is, is our best chance of, 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 of being capable of doing that. Um, and then biochar is this incredible tool that can help us, you know, both carry those biology back to the soil and store that carbon, um, create that sponge to work with all the other um, elements and, 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 and minerals in the cycle to to restore the soil because yeah there's it's the one hopeful thing we have is that we can now build soil faster than ever with an understanding and an appreciation of these processes um a lot of us were um some of us were at the oxford farming conference recently and uh some of the rivers and streets in oxford look very much like this picture in the middle uh you know we are we can see our topsoil in our in our rivers uh, and it's washing away um, into the sea where and and the worst thing for the plant biomass point on that is that then that is um, contaminating that is preventing the, the 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 growth of healthy ecosystems in the coastlines that you know for example the kelp forests um, are being affected by all of this runoff um, swamped there's low oxygen zones as a result of the nitrogen washing off the fields and all of this can be fixed by making the soil back into a sponge um, which charcoal and microbiology can accelerate so that's some of like the motivation i just wanted to share about the, the just to remind people that like co-composting that came up so brilliantly with sylvia um, and the earthly guys in the last talk sylvia was advocating that we all do co-composting with biochar using up to 50% biochar in the composting process 
Um, and I wanted to put out there that it's the best thing to have on hand if you want to run a compost loop, for example, um, for any kind of small holding or event. Um, we always used to have the urine separator on our compost loo run off dry biochar and then i simply hot composted it afterwards and that seemed to give really good um results um yeah it can be made in loads of ways i'm really excited to introduce martin in a minute um who has just done some of the most inventive stove innovation i've seen and um this is the, the sort of the uh, yeah, these are some of the cool, like just show, shows you how much energy is in this wood and how actually when you burn it super cleanly without any smoke, you get this amazing material as a byproduct. Um, Brian was the first the person to show me that the wooden, the, you know, Pied invented this wooden grate as far as I'm concerned, using wood to hold in the wood and then the wood burns down and burns through the wood and then it all turns into a pile of charcoal. And it just it's just genius the way that 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 top lit updraft technology sort of happens these are some of the stack burners that um we called them after um getting inspired by brian that we've that we've done around the place you can do them straight in the earth and there's enough oxygen flowing up out of the earth almost you know going down into the because cold air is rising and it's feeding the fire and it looks like you're making a flamethrower in the earth that's also really useful for cooking on like um heating water and then finally Biochar is the ultimate like partner with fungi, which are the best allies for storing the soil carbon and creating that, recreating that soil carbon sponge. This is um from Caroline's talk yesterday. Um the the the, the results of her growing in small basis project with Plymouth University. And this is an amazing picture from their lab of the fungal hyphae networks colonizing that have colonized them, their biochar. Um so yeah, that was it. I believe there's um I also wanted to advocate that we could, um, in the future of this uh, composting network and project, add um, biochar to our compost and use it for like um, preserving the compost in a way or making it more, you know, because the challenge is selling something that's 50% moisture and really wet and live is quite challenging. Um, so I found adding biochar to the bags to sort of dried biochar and then 50% compost. I was, I was actually using about 80, 20% biochar, 80% compost helped to sort of take that moisture away and made the bags, the, the nice compostable packaging last longer. And this is just one way of, of the millions of uses of biochar's uh, various properties. Um, but just a little um, insight there. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Martin, um, who has prepared his first, his first presentation for us. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love, uh, yeah. Over to you, mate. I'm going to host you now and can't wait to see what you're going to show us. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Uh, let me get the, share the screen. Do you guys all see it? So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's get into it then. So my name is Martijn Jager. I'm originally from the Netherlands. And about 11 years ago, I had the opportunity to move to Portugal. And so the presentation outline, first I'm going to tell why I got into biochar. Then I'm going to show you about my journey with low budget stove building and biochar production. Then I'm going to show you the development of my indoor biochar production system. Then some conclusions that I came to from nearly a decade of making biochar and stock development. Some ways how to use biochar. And I'm going to tell you about our products and services that we offer as a business. Plus, I'm going to, and then I'm going to round it up with some current developments and goals for the coming year. So why I got into biochar. So here in Portugal, it's a Mediterranean dry climate. So that means that uh, for at least half a year, we typically do not get any precipitation. And then we have in winter, we have a couple periods that we do get uh, lots of rain. Uh, because of this dry weather, it's very challenging to compost, to compost the woody biomass because you have to keep it moist. If it dries out, it just doesn't break down. 
And because of the climate, it's very important that the soil actually is able to hold moisture. And currently, the, in most places, there's virtually no soil organic carbon, which you can see in these following pictures. This was me digging some swales to try and capture that winter rain and allow it to infiltrate in the soil. And as you can see on the picture on the right, it's just it's a very thin layer of uh, of clay sitting on top of limestone. And there's really there's no organic material at all on top of the soil, like that whole soil horizon is not there. So what most people do with their woody biomass is they just burn it because otherwise, if you don't burn it and you don't shred it with a chipper, it's just going to stay like that, like a pile you'll see in, here in the foreground. If you don't touch it, it would it would stay there for 10, 20 years and it, it just it doesn't break down at all. So in the wet season, so from autumn till spring, you see all these massive white loops of smoke everywhere. And that's people burning their olive tree prunings, the, the almond tree prunings, and all their woody biomass. So here is a picture of me on that exact same day where my neighbor was burning. You can see the, the plume of smoke here in the picture on the left. And with me with a flame cap kiln, I uh, wasn't making any smoke. On the pictures on the right, I have the arrows pointed roughly to where my kiln is. And you can see there's no smoke at all. And most of the neighbors, of my neighbors would not even know that I was burning anything because there's no smoke and there's also no smell when you burn bi uh, biomass down to biochar in a flame cap kiln. But this is a picture is already further along my journey. And I first started with a pop lit, lit updraft kiln, a very basic system was just a bucket with another bucket on top that was holding the chimney. And as you can see, this my first burn, I, I quenched it a bit too early because there's still some uh, unburned almond shells there visible. Uh, this system I did not use very long because it was a bit hazardous to remove the top bucket and the chimney to be able to quench the material. And I actually ended up with a, a third degree burn on my arm because the, uh, the almost glowing red flu pipe was touching my arm when I was removing it at the end of the bird. I was quickly looking for a better solution. Then I came across a stainless steel cylinder from a soda keg, which I then uh, I made a contraption with two other, with two paint buckets, 15 liter buckets, to make a more manageable uh, flame or uh, tealer gasifier. At first, just uh, the, the gasifier itself, and then quickly I put uh, a pot stand to be able to cook and heat water and, and make some use of the process energy. Then I wasn't really satisfied with the amount of biochar that that produced. So I was experimenting with some bigger T-load systems. There's a, a 25 liter bucket inside the 60 liter drum again with a uh, small flume on top and that progressed into trying to make a retort that was fed by a, a rocket stove but here one of my main issues was that i wasn't happy that i was burning biomass down to ash just for the sake of creating biochar from other bio biomass because the, i was i felt I, I was losing out on potential biochar and also there was a bit of an issue with uh, some gas leakage at the top. And it was a hassle because I had to remove the retort because the opening was on the bottom. It took a long time to feed it. And so I was not super keen on that. Then I tried putting that same retort on top of the previous T-Bird stove. But that was also was a bit of a logistical issue at the end of the T-Lot burn. I had to remove the retort and to build uh, the T-Lot. So that uh, also was quite short-lived. Then I made a larger T-Lot with a 60-liter drum, which worked quite well. 
but the issue with this one I had I had already come to the conclusion that if you quench the the tila with water directly inside the, the system, it severely reduces the lifespan of your steel buckets. So I was uh, I was tipping this over. And of course, with the size of this, it was also a bit on the dangerous side. So this was also not very long lived. And then luckily on one of my, uh, I was going to see some friends from uh, about 15 kilometers away. And on my way, as I was cycling there, I found a plastic container, like uh, it was a, a pool filter housing, like a sand filter. I found it at the bin, so I had already set it aside to pick it up on my way back. So I showed my friends a picture of that uh, of that sand filter, and one of them asked, "Is it metal?" I said, "No, I wish." So on my way home from visiting my friends, not far from leaving their place, I actually found this container that someone had put out at the side of the bin. So I dragged it home on my bicycle, and I had to walk because it was a bit too too heavy on the back. But I managed to get it home, and I turned that into my next Tila gasifier. Right. And to get rid of the issue, with get rid of the issue of having to tip it out into the into a bottle of water, I decided to put a door at the bottom, so that when it was time to quench, I could just pull a pin and let it all drop in this bath here at the bottom. And this worked quite well. But with uh, T-LEDs this size, and actually I'm not entirely sure how big one this one was. I think it was maybe 80 meters. But as you can see in the next pictures, here's a, a picture series of the whole burn. I think pictures taken every so many minutes. At the 20 minute mark, you can already see that the flames are reaching the bottom. While the actual flame front is still about halfway up at the kiln. Because if you put chunky biomass inside the T-LED, it just things start to fall through the cracks and the burn gets a bit uneven. And this is actually also an issue I've seen lots of people have with the barrel and barrel retort system, that the burn can become quite uneven and there's uh, burning biomass falling further down. And that creates a situation where there's too much biomass off gassing which then means that there's not enough oxygen being able to mix with the smoke to achieve a clean combustion. And one issue with this system I was having is that uh, the secondary combustion, the big flame, was also going off quite quite often. So I had to keep a burning stick there to make sure that it stayed lit. All in all, it worked quite well and it was quite uh, but quite a lot of fun to, to run this gasifier. And especially at the end of the burn to then pull the pin and have all the, the embers fall out and quench into that bath. And so I went from a very big gasifier, then I went to, I was thinking, oh, I've gone big and I didn't want to go any bigger. So I thought, let's see how small I can go. <laughs> So I built a very small gasifier from a thermos flask that was 50 uh, centiliters, about half a liter. And because of this small size, I was restricted to the use of stove pellets because any other fuel doesn't, just doesn't have the energy density to make use of the, of the fire. <laughs> And because the stove pellets are quite dense, there was also the necessity for a small ventilator to make sure that there was enough oxygen for a clean combustion. And then this is the same drum that I used earlier with the 60 liter retort in, on the inside or the 60 liter t -LED. And I decided to use this as a, as a t -LED on its own. And because it has air holes on the bottom, it's not necessary for this method to have like a cone shaped, such as with the pit burn method. Because if you leave the, uh, the primary air holes open at the beginning of the burn, there's enough air going in to create a clean combustion. And then as the burn progresses and as the barrel fills up with embers, I then close down the bottom air supply 
and it just kept feeding it on the top as if it was a flame that kill until the barrel was completely full and at which point you can quench it with water or alternatively you can put a lid on top if you have a, a barrel that has a lid with a clamp i have to say that personally i prefer to water quench because i think it gives a, a, a better quality char and you don't have the risk of of opening things too soon which can happen if you if you put a lid on it and you open it while it's still a bit hot then it can just start smoldering again wow, so cool martin what would you call that that design that's a retort that you turned into a flame cap is that right uh well it is it is, i started out as a tea lot because I, I filled it completely with biomass and i lit it from the top but then at like uh when it's halfway full or about two thirds full with embers, I close the bottom at which point it becomes a flame cap kiln basically. Okay. Elad to flame cap. Thank you. Exactly. But <laughs> like you have to have the, the primary air holes open at the beginning because if a flame cap kiln has uh, vertical sides, then there's just not enough oxygen reaching the, the actual fire for it to, to properly carbonize. So it really helps to have those to have those air holes, or unless you can start higher up with the fire, then that would also work. So I saw Brian put a post with the with the metal grate in the bottom, and I guess that also is a way to make sure that there's still enough oxygen at the beginning stage of the fire. Because if you would try and light a fire on the bottom of a barrel, it gets a bit more difficult. Thanks. Yeah. So here I have another small T-LUT gasifier, which uh, it worked, but it, it still wasn't burning as clean as I hoped it would be. And I made some adjustments. This this was mainly running on uh, almond shells. And then I later added a ventilator. This is a completely different stove. It's not, I did not modify the, the first one, but I made a new one with uh, a single uh, primary and secondary air opening instead of holes all the way around and the opening at the top I enlarged as well and this I use for, for quite a bit for some, some small cooking stuff like that and then in January 2017 I made my first experiment with the pit burn method because I had uh, quite a bit of scrap pellet wood from raised bed gardens that uh, didn't really work in this climate because every time I was trying to water it, the water would just run off the sides because it was creeping in through all the gaps in the wood. So I had a lot of that wood to, to get rid of. So I dug myself a, a, a pit and I used that method instead. And I instantly loved it because it was it, it's such a productive method and it's so time efficient. You don't have to cut things up and put it into a large tea lot. Just you can cut things up as you go. This was a, a rather small hole, which I then later moved elsewhere and enlarged. So I used the, the pit burn method I used for quite some years. And then at a certain point, I had this large, uh, this is a, a hot water tank, a solar hot water tank. And I made uh, a, a proper flame cap kiln above the ground. And as soon as I used it the first time, my first thought was, why did I not do this much sooner? Because the, the convenience of having a flame cap kiln above the ground compared to a burn <coughs> is enormous because you uh, you can escape from a lot of the heat with a with pit in the ground. You have all that heat directly in your face. Whereas with a kiln, you can, if you approach the kiln from a bit lower, you can, you're shielded by the sides of the kiln. They're much more convenient uh, to use. This one had a slight downside that it was way too big. It was quite large. So I always ended up with like the embers would accumulate in the center. And then I'd have to shovel them to the sides. Uh, and it, it was just, it was too much to, to keep feeding. And it was very hard work to keep up with that large flame front. 
but flame cap kilns, it's the, the size of the opening on the top that determines how much biomass you have to keep adding all the time. So the bigger that is, the, the, the quicker you have to run with, with keeping up with it, especially if you feed it with very twiggy and thin branches, which is my preferred feedstock, because the, the thinner the branches are, the hotter the fire will burn. Uh, this is a second flame cap kiln I built, which was a lot smaller, about 200 meters, and also much more portable, which then made it possible for me to start doing burns at other people's places as well. So what I found was very helpful when starting a fire in a flame cap kiln is to create like a grid about halfway up the kiln and light the fire on top of that to also allow a lot of oxygen flow at the beginning of the fire. Because then it, it seems to get going much quicker. And there's uh, less risk of being left with lots of unburnt embers at the bottom of your kiln, which can happen if you start the fire directly on the bottom. And then I made a small stainless steel version of this of the uh, pyramid kiln to be able to do workshops and if you take it with me on the bicycle or in the train just purely for, for portability. And of course, in terms of biochar production, it becomes less efficient because it still, still takes about two hours to fill this one up. But it's nice for, for like small campfires and, and evenings with friends, for example. And then in March, I decided to cut up that massive flame cap kiln because it was just too big and use that, uh, that top panel to create a smaller flame cap kiln that was still portable, but not too big and easy to manage by myself to, to manage the fire. And then eventually the two ends of that large one and another small kiln, just because I had it laying around. And then I started making some other uh, flame cap kilns, different sizes. Also to be able to sell to people that wanted to have their own flame cap kiln. There's one 70 by 70 centimeters at the top, and that's 80 liters. So cool. And, and then this is my latest kiln because the previous one I sold, and then I had to quickly build another one, which was then this one. And this is the kiln I'm currently using which holds 360 liters, which is it's a very, a very convenient size. And then indoor biochar production. So I started this at the same time while I was still developing the outer systems as well. And because I was realizing there was so much heat being produced with those Tila gasifiers, that it seemed like a waste to not find a way to actually use that to heat the house in winter. So winters can get a bit chilly here in Portugal. So I thought, let's find a way to combine this with an indoor system to make use of all that heat. So I made this massive cob structure in the corner of my house. And at the beginning, uh, it's using the same 20 liter cylinder that I was using at the very beginning. And in the beginning, I was lifting it in via the top. And I was quenching it. Actually, I'm not sure how it, I think I was trying to shut off the oxygen supply, which did work, but then to, to empty the, the cylinder, it was a hassle. So I put a door in place to be able to move the cylinder in and out and take the cylinder outside for quenching. Um, an issue I had with this whole system is that even though it produced a lot of heat from the from the cylinder, the, the cob mass was just way too big and it took multiple consecutive burns for it to start warming up enough to actually start radiating heat into the house. And in between, I made a small biochar tube inspired by the biochar loop, which is basically a piece of stovepipe that you can put inside of a conventional wood stove. 
like a little record. So you can get some some biochar production out of a normal wood stove. And I made this from a stove pipe that I cut roughly one third or 25% and 75%. Then I hammered the ends flat. So it was all sealed and I could still open and close it. This one was a bit too big. So then I made a smaller one, which was just a stainless steel can from a Chinese shop. And something to note with these, I think it's very important that if you make one of these, it's best to find a stainless steel container that just slides, the, that the lid just slides on top instead of screwing. Because if for whatever reason uh, the holes get blocked and they don't uh, ventilate the gases out properly, you want it to be able to just pop open and not build up any pressure. Because that's, that's the last thing you want inside of a wood stove, of course. So this is my second indoor stove. Because the previous one was not giving enough uh, radiant heat into the space, I figured, well, let's make one for metal. Then going to have more radiant heat. And that uh, worked great, except it gave way too much heat. This, this house was, uh, was a very small house. So it, uh, it, got, it got way too hot, like 35 degrees, quickly after lighting the stove. And as soon as the stove went out, all the heat would also be gone as well because there was no, no heat retention there. This one, I was using a 12 liter cylinder, another gas container. And I have there the nuts and bolts on the outside because that gave me, I made a handle to be able to lift it in and out of the system, which was a little bit, was not the most convenient, but it worked. Then that uh, the next uh, winter, I had already removed uh, the metal stove because it just gave too much heat and wasn't wasn't comfortable enough. So I put a metal barrel on top of the old system to get more radiant heat out of it um, and get a better heating for the space. Then after that, I made a large masonry system, which was still using the 20 liter PLUT. And this one, this one was, I would say, was working perfectly because it had both a lot of direct radiant heat from the steel top and uh, the brick skin was light enough to, to start radiating heat after about an hour or so, but still had enough thermal mass to retain the heat after the stove was already out. So this would stay warm almost until the morning if I was lighting it at night a couple of times. But I was super convenient. And I was even cooking some pizza still on the cooktop on top there with a, a ceramic pot that I put on top of there. But the, still the big issue with this system and the, the 20 liter cylinder is that to quench it, I was taking the cylinder outside the house and then quenching it in a bucket which was fine for me, but it's not something that other people would do inside their house because there was like some bits of embers falling out from the bottom and it wasn't the, the safest of situations, but it definitely worked and it kept me very warm in the winter. Then I made a, a large metal version, which technically is an indoor version, but I've never used it indoors but it, it could be used in as well. This is what's the beginning of 2020. And here I put a, a small uh, a water distillation system on top. This was like early days of COVID and we didn't know what was gonna happen. And if the supermarkets would still be supplied with everything. So I wanted to have a way to at least have some, some clean purified water for myself. That's why I made a small water distillation system on top of the tea lot. And then at a certain point, I realized that the small tea lot gasifier I had was actually the burnt the most clean. So I went back to small, and this time with a 1.3 liter thermos flask. And then I turned that also into an indoor stove. 
Uh, this is in the same location where I had the large uh, masonry system, the first indoor system, which I had, I started demolishing and I put a small metal version with this 1.3 liter uh, classifier there. And then I actually made a couple of uh, extra cylinders also in one liter. So I could regulate the temperature on the cook plate based on which gasifier I was using. For example, if I was cooking like a soup, I would start it with the 1.3 liter gasifier, which would bring the water to a boil. Now, when that was finished, after an hour or so, I would switch it to the one liter gasifier to maintain like a soft rolling boil, like, like a soup that was boiling for a couple of hours. And that gave me some flexibility with the heat output. And then I made some, I made a base with uh, three of the one liter tube gasifiers. And as you can see on the bottom right picture, it's, uh, the picture is a bit fake, but it reads 492 degrees Celsius. And this is a cast iron sewer lid of half an inch. So that got incredibly hot with just three of those little burners. And then to test things even further, I made a small hot water heat exchanger to be able to take hot baths directly cooled with, uh, with the gasifier in it or heated with the gasifier. And it only it takes less than two kilos of wood, and that's enough to get uh, a hot bath of uh, of water. And that, is, that shows how efficient the, the system works. And actually, on top of the heat exchanger, I can put my hand when it's running, because the heat exchanger is so efficient at pulling all the heat from the from the gasifiers. And then this is the vinyl version of the Kilo gasifier that I made also an installed plan so available. This was in November 2021. After I had used the previous system for about a year to make sure that it was convenient to use um, and it was working as I, as I wanted it to work. 1.3 liter burner. It runs on 800 grams of stove pellets. Gives about 150 gram, 15 grams of biochar. Takes about 55 to 70 minutes to burn. And this is very dependent on the atmosphere conditions. Like on some days, uh, I think like 55 minutes is the, is the average time. But some days when the air pressure is a bit different, then the burn can take a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So the heat output is roughly 1800 watts. There's a 50 by 50 centimeter triangular base. The cooktop has a height of 87 centimeters, which is quite convenient. And it uses 80 millimeter flue pipes, which are widely available. It's just the same type of flue that uh, conventional pellet stoves are using. Amazing. And, that, and you've, you've made a plan, you've open sourced the plans for that, Marty, you're selling uh, the plan. I, I'm selling the plans on my website, yes. Great. And then um, this September, we picked a huge amount of prickly pears. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with there, with them. It's a, a cactus fruit. And those cactuses, they just grow wild here in many places. They produce a huge amount of fruits, which are quite uh, sweet, but they have a, a large amount of seeds, so they're not very convenient to eat as it is. But to make jam is, is perfect. So because I knew I was going to be making that jam, I made another kilo gasifier system where I have the pot submerged into the bell to get the more efficient heat exchange there. So the pot is also heated from the sides. So we made about seven kilograms of jam and we used, here yeah, I cannot see actually, uh, no wait, yeah. So this is the amount of biochar that we produced with both sterilizing the jars for the jam and boiling the jam itself. So we only did, I think, two, yeah, we did two burns, I think. So that's, uh, and they, it would seem like a very small amount of, uh, of biochar. And that's a bit the downside of this tea gasifier. It burns so efficient and uses so little stove pellets 
that of course the biochar output was also quite small. Of course, it's much better than burning gas where there's no biochar production at all. And I also made a small pizza oven that uses my two of the one liter Tilo gasifiers. Uh, this is a product. Uh, uh, I had many, I had made already many uh, previous attempts at this, but there was always issues. Either I had too much top heat or too much bottom heat. And it was not easy to find the right balance between uh, having a good heat distribution in the oven. But I think I finally cracked that. So now we have delicious Italian pizzas that we cook at home using a carbon negative pizza oven. Right. Could you share the design of that? How's the top working? How what's is that are they the flues coming out the top or yeah, that... there uh, there's there, there's two flues coming out the top. So the, the flames go in on the bottom. Mm. Then the flame travels under a steel plate towards the back. Mm. And then it circles back over the top of the pizza to get all that heat from the top. Uh, and then, then the gas goes out on the top again. So th theoretically, this could also be put inside the house if the flu was connected to like to going outside. And this system, I have not made any, is not available, but I might add it to the, the gasifier plants at some point as well which if I do add that, then everyone that has bought the plant previously, they will be able to also access the, the, the updates. Yes. Uh, so some, some, some conclusions. So in my opinion, the flame cap kilns and pit burns are the most efficient way to produce uh, large quantities of biochar because there's the least amount of feedstock preparation uh, you can scale it up however big you want, up to a certain degree, of course, because it's too big and it becomes uh, too, too challenging to keep up with feeding the fire. But it, it's such a, a no-brainer, and all you need really is a shovel and, uh, and some soil, basically, to just dig a hole and you can get started. So which size that is most uh, suitable really depends on your on your specific context and available feedstock. So if you have a lot of, let's say, bamboo or straight coppice poles, then you might benefit more from a longer rough uh, type thing. Or if you have uh, fruit tree prunings that are a bit shorter, maybe a bit wider as well, then you might benefit more from a square or a round sized kiln. Then, in my opinion, the tilot gasifiers are the most suitable system if you want to use to process energy, because they're just they're they're so contained, and especially if you're using stove pellets, they're they're very predictable. Like what, when you light a tilot gasifier filled with stove pellets, you know it's going to burn for this many minutes, and you could even walk away and then come back just before it's about to be finished. Uh, and it's a very it's a very consistent heat output, which for most heat applications it's important that you know that the output is going to be consistent. Then, in my experience, the small size tilts uh, burn a lot cleaner than the larger ones. For example, with the twenty liter system, I was doing some cooking as well, and there was uh, quite a large amount of soot build up on the bottom of my pots which with the small size pilots, I have no issues with soot building up because they, they burn so clean. Sometimes I've even used them to uh, to dry my hair, which may sound a bit crazy since I don't have much hair at the moment. So the ones I did, and I was just drying it above the flames of the, of the, the pilot gasifiers. And they burn so clean, you can also, you cannot smell that they're burning. Like the only thing you're smelling it's just the smell of hot air, not much like a hair, a hair blower or something like that. Then, in my opinion, the retorts only make sense if you are condensing byproducts like wood vinegar or in, uh, in wood tar, or in case you, you put a small retort inside uh, a wood stove to be able to get some, some biochar out of that. 
And I would really recommend people to not waste their time with the 55 and 30 gallon barrel and barrel system because the system is inefficient by design. Because if you have to burn 25 gallons worth of biomass down to ashes just to pyrolyze 30 gallons of biomass, then you're already starting out uh, a couple steps behind. And the method also it takes uh, quite a while to set up if you wanted to burn properly and evenly. So I really recommend people to, to skip that step in their biochar development and go straight for flame cap kilns because they're, they're much more efficient in my opinion. Then I'd like to say some things about how to use biochar. I've noticed that a lot of people uh, come across the issue of crushing, which seems to be a bigger obstacle than the actual making of the biochar. So the big question is then, do you even need to crush it or not? And there's a couple of ways to use biochar without having to crush it. So what you would do after making a biochar, you just run it through a screen to get rid of all the fine material, which is essentially already crushed. And then the larger chunks you can use, for example, in a trainers layer, in uh, water filtration systems, in water reservoirs in container gardening, or you can let livestock do the crushing. And then as low-tech crushing methods, if you do want to further crush the, the larger bits, I highly recommend making or buying a soil tamper, like one that could also be used for little earth back uh, shelters, Adobe uh, method, or use a heavy duty lawn roller, ideally one that's made from steel. Uh, here's a way of using large parts of uh, biochar in a gray water filtration system from a shower, or as I call it, a shower to soil system. So I have a drainage pipe coming out of the shower basin that's wrapped in geotextile. This drainage pipe has holes in it, of course, for water to escape. And then it's falling into a bed of biochar, which is sloped a bit backwards to the left. You just cannot see the picture, but it's sloping downside. So the water that's then draining from the, from the shower is able to soak up that biochar. And then the biochar offers some water retention. And I planted this out with sugar cane on the left and Betty Bear on the front. And uh, Betty Bear is an excellent grass that's uh, mainly used for soil erosion uh, stabilization because they have an incredibly deep root system. Their roots can go up to seven meters deep in some cases. And then in the picture on the right, you can see this system is about five months after it's been installed. You can see that. Uh, the sugar cane is growing quite nicely, and the betty bear as well has, uh, has developed uh, very good. Then here is a grease trap plus green filter for the kitchen sink to soil system. So the black container on the left is the, the grease trap that traps the grease that uh, it floats to the top. The water exits the, the container on the, on the bottom there, then it's filtered to a um, this large container full of very chunky biochar and uh, the filtered water at the top is then allowed to exit the system via this elbow pipe. And unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of this with the plants in place, because this I planted with mint and I had some Phalaris arundinacea in there as well, which is a, a wetland type grass, which I think you guys have growing in the UK as well, quite prolifically. And those plants were doing amazing, just growing in pure biochar chunks, being fed with uh, the wastewater from the kitchen sink. Wow. And then here is uh, in the water reservoir and container gardening. On the right side is uh, a bathtub, which is a wicking bed, which is a system as I've also experimented with quite a bit here in Portugal. Because water, water saving is uh, is a big issue here, the drought conditions. So we want to reduce all the evaporation as much as possible. And a great way to do that is growing in containers that are fed uh, from the bottom, so you don't have surface evaporation. 
and uh, as my developments uh, developed over the years, I started putting more and more biochar in those systems because uh, a lot of people either put gravel at the base. Of course, gravel doesn't hold much water. At the beginning, I was putting just pure sand, uh, which already holds a lot more water than gravel, but not nearly as, as much as putting loads and loads of biochar in there. And an added benefit of the biochar is that they can also capture some of the nutrients as they want to reach out in the winter when you get rains and the plants might overflow a bit. It kind of filters the, the effluent bit, the overflow. And then on the left is a, a normal container made from a large truck tire, which are then, uh, I kept one of the side walls on, which then creates a donut shaped well to hold water. And then the large center hole, I also filled completely with biochar to prevent any runoff if they do overflow. We could capture those nutrients so they stay contained. And then lastly, uh, I was uh, uh, a big fan of using heat litter composting. That's a system whereby you, instead of knocking out the the animal pen every week or every couple of days, you just allow a large, uh, you allow their bedding to just build up. And you keep adding uh, organic material and uh, carbon rich material to balance out for their high nitrogen manure. And in Portugal, it can be quite challenging to find large amounts of wood chips or, or wooden biomass in general. And because of that, it also really helps to have biochar there. Because the biochar neutralizes their uh, their nit their high nitrogen output much more and much uh, longer term than uh, the wood chips alone would do, and this was for me sufficient uh, to completely eliminate all smells from the ducks. Even though in winter it would sometimes get a bit muddy, it all stayed uh, proper hygienic. And uh, the compost that resulted from this system was absolutely the best compost I, I ever made, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and I was just throwing this in by the bucket loads or sometimes whole wheel barrels at the time. And, and the ducks really loved the stuff. They would go for it, they would pack at it. And as you can see in the bottom right picture, it's just uh, their resulting poop, which was sometimes completely black. And it just wouldn't smell the poop. It had zero smell to it at all. The ducks were all very happy. They are uh, laying lots of eggs, so they, they seem to be thriving on uh, on having lots of biochar available at their choice. And then here's an example of a soil tamper. So on the left is something that was uh, found here. Not sure what they originally used it for. And then this started to fall apart and rot at certain points. So I made one from steel from a small gas cylinder, like a camping gas container. And this works quite well on, on crushing biochar on a small scale. So I would crush this so often, I would put it inside a, a woven bag, like an old ink bag or something, uh, give it a couple of blows with, uh, with the crusher, then run it through a screen of my choice, typically holes about three millimeters and then any parts that were too big i would just return to the back crush again and then rinse and repeat until all the biochar was crushed to the consistency of my like so then a bit about our products and services so obviously we make biochar besides the biochar we also started producing wood vinegar uh, we're hosting workshops and offering uh, private burns for people that have lots of biomass and they want to get rid of it and still retain some, some value out of it. And also want to learn how to make biochar themselves. We make flame cap kilns if people are interested in buying those so to make their own biochar. We make smoked black salt, which is uh, salt that we uh, smoke between brackets because we don't literally smoke it. But we use our wood vinegar to smoke the salt and we add biochar as well to collect the color. Then we have that bear plants, Californian white sage. It's a, a big issue with Californian white sage is that it's a, a plant that's threatening, is threatened by over harvesting in their native environment. 
and uh, it's it's basically being poached like people head into the into the wild there with large backpacks just on a mission to grab as much as much white sage as they can grab just to feed the global market for smudge sticks. And here in Portugal, we have the perfect climate for growing these plants. So I started a couple of those and selling them because nobody else uh, had them available here. And then we have the digital towns. So here are some pictures of biochar. We offer biochar for use in the garden. We have various grades. We have a very fine, uh, finely ground powder that people can use in soil lawns, where they don't, uh, where they can just allow it to, to mix in with their aeration equipment. And then we have a chunky mix for tree planting, vegetable gardens. Uh, we offer biochar for pets that they can use as a supplement, toxify. And then we have a very fine grain uh, biochar made from hemp, the inner stuff of the hemp, which we sell for as a tooth powder, in which we also use ourselves to, to clean our teeth. And we use hemp for this because it's uh, less abrasive than most other uh, charcoal tooth powders uh, that are on the market. And activated charcoal, for example, is often made from, uh, from coconut shell. And it tends to be a bit more hard uh, on the microscopic level. And there's some pictures of me selling with vinegar at the local garden fair. This was during a private firm. I was uh, teaching a team of the organic farm how to make uh, biochar. It started with that. Right, another picture on the private firm. Plain cup kilns, which are here available. The pictures of uh, smoked salt. A picture of the smoked salt and, uh, and some eggs. It gives a nice contrast to a dish, but adds, uh, it adds flavor and uh, it looks nice. Wow. Is that, does it go that color just by adding the vinegar to the salts? No, no. We, we also add some biochar to it. We add some of the hemp biochar, and that gives it the color. Okay, so it's like what fifty percent biochar, fifty percent salt. No, it's uh, it's actually written on the label. It's zero point seven percent biochar. So it's only okay. a very only a very small amount, but because the biochar is so finely ground, it manages to cover all the salt and and still give a significant uh, impact on the color. It's such a good point. Though. Like, why doesn't why does nobody eat biochar at any level here? Like, I saw I everyone was really shocked at a festival this summer. Um, last summer I went to to see these biochar breads. You can put it in bread, and it's it you, makes... you, you can you can put it in just about anything. You can put it yeah. in pasta. You can put it in like like really everything. Incredible. Uh, and the salt the salt does really well at markets. Like it's a, it's a great opener. Like if people just pass by, ask, oh, "Would you like to try some smoked salt?" And smoked salt, I've never heard of that. And then they try it. They they often buy it, and then that also gets the conversation going. And they they might learn a thing or two about the other products as well. Whereas otherwise, they would just walk by. It's a it's a great conversation starter for us. This, this product. Brilliant. And this and, and the salt is also it's locally harvested here in the Algarve. And it's uh, it's hand harvested, so, uh, not done on a massive scale. So it's uh, it's a very it's a local product. I'm quite happy to have that. And then uh, the Betty Ver, these are pictures that the client sent, where he's using it to for some soil stabilization on terraces. And this is I think was less than six months after being planted. Uh, I'm guessing by now these plants are probably one and a half meters high, maybe two meters high even. And they're great at stabilizing the soil to prevent erosion. And if you're close enough to the water table, that can also help pull some of that moisture up and make it available for other plants. And the amazing thing about this plant is that it's super drought tolerant, but at the same time also tolerates water logging. So if you have very heavy clay soil and you get like massive puddles in, in winter, it will still tolerate that uh, those conditions as well. 
it, it's so so tolerant of water that we can actually you can put it inside a pond and it, it will do well also. So it's drought tolerant and you can live in a pond. So it's it's a very resilient uh, type of grass. And it's sterile, so it's not, not invasive. Because here in Portugal, we have quite some issues with invasive grasses that propagate and end up everywhere. And then here's a picture of the California white sage, which also for this climate here is absolutely perfect. But on the picture on the right, you can see that it's a, a gabion cage. With, uh, in the center is uh, a column of a very sandwich soil. So the water retention in the soil is, is very, very low. And I would water this like two, three times in the summer and that was it. And it would, it would just thrive under those conditions. And the bees absolutely love it. Because these flower spikes, they go up about two meters and they flower after the normal sages are done flowering. That really extends the, the pollen season for the bees as well. And then finally, we have the digital downloads, which is on the left of our indoor biochar pinot gasifier. And uh, so this contains the, the indoor system, that contains instructions to build the triangular base, has information about the uh, hot water and heat exchanger as well. That's really all you need to know to, to start making your own little uh, indoor biochar stove. And the heat output of this system, it's perfect for if you have a van or tiny house or personal spaces, or just for supplementing supplemental heating larger spaces as well. And then we, all, we also have a, a waking bed building guide with all the instructions of how we will build our waking beds. And that's a collection of, I think, four or five different builds. So you know, can see with different containers, with bathtubs, with truck tires, with normal buckets. I just have to say that uh, here in Portugal, we don't get uh, significant amounts of frost. So my wicking beds are built without a drain. So I cannot drain the reservoir in the winter because here there's no need to. So for people in the UK, they would have to include the drain as well because you don't want the system to start freezing in the winter, of course. Yeah. Um, that's about it, really. And then I oh, yeah, the current development. So at the moment, we're still working to improve the wood vinegar system. It has been another thing of uh, lots of trial and error and trying things and, uh, and burning things down because uh, it got a little bit too hot, um, having issues with insulation and stuff. So we're still uh, busy working on that. Um, we want to bring a physical TILA gasifier on the market. So that's the, this one on the left. And we're gonna focus on just the burner with a base, but we're still working on finalizing the base to get a more, a bit more appealing uh, version of that, maybe with an integrated pot stand or something like that. And something I would like to achieve this year is starting to do some alcohol distillation using the TIMO gasifier as well. So we can start bringing some carbon negative tinctures on the market, which I think uh, might well as well. And then lastly, I want to try and make a TIMO powered forge to be able to uh, start melting aluminium and maybe even copper and make some functional items with that, just to show uh, what is possible with the TILA gasifiers and uh, how big the heat output is and how hot, how hot the, the stoves actually burn, just as a, as a proof of concept, really. And that's about it. Amazing. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing, dude. Um, yeah questions oh. i mean i've got loads <laughs> i'm sure others have too um Shoot. yeah i mean so we martin we make um a lot of hydrosols um in in in, in our little world we we distill like plants to make hydrosols and then use them to flavor yeah. kombucha. like 
I have, I have, I put a big, big, I put various stills on biochar heat before, and I've had some success, but I need more consistency over a longer period of time. I mean, something like what Brian, Brian's rocket with a pocket where you can just pyrolyze the end of sticks and sort of keep feeding them in. I don't know if you've seen that design, but something that doesn't yeah, yeah, I've seen yeah, yeah. a batch ending to it. Um, like, uh, cause, cause, cause the, all of the fit systems I've, I've got are quite crude compared to yours. Amazing, like refined ones. And they all have a sort of, and they, they get, they get, they get like, they're like quite hot, quite hot, quite hot, really, 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 really hot. And then they're finished, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, need to get, yeah, that's one thing. Let me go back a bit. Yeah. With the, the triple base that I have, if I start one burner at one point, and then let's say wait 10 minutes before I start the next burner, and then wait another 10 minutes before I start the third burner, then you can get like a sequence going where the heat output stays more or less consistent over the whole period. And you just swap out one burner at a time, basically. Yeah, that's it. That's the way to do it, isn't it? But but it's still because uh, this one liter burner only burns for like fifty two minutes, so mm. you you still like you have to keep reloading them. But they're actually they're quite easy to to reload, which I've actually been doing this today. Uh, to reload, you just you empty them in another container, which you then snuff or you put them in a bucket of water or something, and you can directly fill them again with new stove pellets and then you can actually put part of the biochar you just thrown out well not if you put it in water of course but if you don't put it in water you can put part of the biochar back on top and then place it back on top of the base and it starts burning within like two three minutes it has a proper flame again so it's a very quick way to, to cycle the same burner and get more consistency out of it Okay, cool. And then do you just, those handles, do, do you still need fire gloves because of the way you've designed that all? Uh, in this uh, this way at the moment, not. Uh, it depends. If you put a pot on top, then you might need to have like a normal leather glove or something because then more heat is reflected downwards. But uh, yeah, I'm using just normal leather gloves, like very thin, thin-skinned leather gloves to, to handle them. Okay. Because the hand the handle here is stainless steel it's just a piece of conduit and because it's hollow it heats up a little but then it starts creating its own airflow so it's basically self-cooling but you can also put like a little wooden handle there instead of a, a steel tube I, I have some other burners that now have wooden handles and, and that also works and and those you can just handle without any gloves just with bare hands uh, it, it's fine oh amazing and uh... Martin, I'd like kind of would like to share your website with people. Would you put it in the comments or maybe even like take us uh, to it quickly so yes. we can see how to sort of support your work? Because it's Let's see. Let's put my hand. any other questions from the from the audience? Um, please don't hesitate to like put your put your videos on and 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 we've got um got a good half an hour now to um ask Martin questions. I know Bono had some um, uh, regarding your ecosystem restoration project, Bono. Because um, I think what's so cool about what you're doing is like you're literally creating climate resilience in your area with this material and this. Exactly. And also like what I'm doing now, and this is a bit different than what you guys are doing with all the compost and stuff. In a lot of areas when I'm expanding the, the vegetable garden, I'm just adding a huge amount of biochar, raw biochar, not inoculated, not loaded with any nutrients, just a huge amount of biochar, mix it into the clay soil, and then use the uh, use the, the fertility afterwards, like li liquid uh, manure or liquid fertilizer preparations. And, and then I can just take soil that is literally unfit for growing anything, but just some, some very strong weeds, all of a sudden, it becomes almost like a loam-like consistency. Wow. 
in the so space of a few weeks. Really using the biochar as a physical input to build the water um, retention capacity of the soil. and then exact, you... Exactly, but not just water retention, because here in the heavy clay soil, it's also very important that the soil is able to drain well. Because mm. in winter, we have a situation where the soil is too dense and too sticky, and you can, you can hardly even dig in it, and it sticks to everything. And the biochar really breaks up that heavy clay, allows it to both uh, drain the wa excess water, but also retain enough water in the summer. It's like it, it completely changes the soil structure enormously. Incredible. Incredible. I Hello, don't know if you're on the phone. Hi, I'm on the phone and it's a bit weird because I don't usually, I'm not usually on the phone. That's really interesting, Martin, because I've been chucking it down on our garden soils as well down at the eco hub and we have really thick clay um yeah. we don't have so much the drought at the moment it's too wet but i've been using it in those two wet conditions but we did have a drought for about three months last year and it's worked really really well and i didn't inoculate yeah. it a lot it just went down because no. we just didn't have time I think if you don't inoculate it, as long as you're aware that you put loads, uh, a large amount of, of raw biochar there, just you can compensate with with uh, like also adding urine to the soil and with diluted urine. Yeah. Just 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 make sure that you that you know that that there's a lack of uh, nutrients of, yeah. of nutrients and and compensate for that with with inputs. And yeah. It's it's all going to be fine. So I think there's a lot of uh, fear going around for people that say, ah, you cannot use raw biochar. It's going to yeah. help your soil of everything. But uh, especially here in my context, of course, for you guys in the UK, it's going to be different. But here, the soil is so poor. There is zero available. There's no carbon in the soil. There's no available nitrogen in the soil. There is hardly any biology in the soil. So there's nothing really that the biochar can rob from the soil because it's not there yet. And mm -hmm. by adding a large amount of biochar in one go, I can like I till it into the soil, and then after that, I don't have to keep working the soil anymore. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the last till you do like because a lot of people talk about do the the in the regenerative movement. It's like we do one last till and we put. Yeah all the good yeah. stuff in there and then we don't have to kill again and so you exactly you put biochar folding biochar into the soil and that in that Ex exactly and if you add large enough quantities of biochar then then it can indeed be the, the last till if you have smaller amounts available and you use less then you have to keep working it into the soil because the biochar works best in the soil and in the root zone I, personally i don't agree with adding biochar on top of the soil especially not in my climate here, because it doesn't seem to work its way down that much. Okay, that's so interesting. I want to hold that one because there's a there's an awesome uh, group here, Martin Earthly, who are now doing a project with the Saving the Ash Tree, and they're, they're applying biochar on top of trees, like as a mulch kind of thing. And and, and okay. the citizen science project, it'd be great to know your perspective on that. Um, like how should if we we you know you've got have you got ash dieback um, in Portugal? Do you have ash trees? Uh, I don't. I, I don't think we've got ash trees. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not in the south. Not in the south here. I think maybe further up north is possible, but here in the yeah. south, I don't think we have them. Well, we're at risk of losing like ninety five percent of our ash trees, which are like the tree of life to this landscape. And right. IOJ has proven really positive, and they're they're they're, they're helping pioneer this this project to get as much biochar onto trees to sort of you know to, yeah. to, to see if it can mitigate the loss and um yeah it'd be interesting to to get your perspective if you if you from what you've learned about biochar well, if they be digging it in i mean you can't really dig in around a tree's root trunk zone well not. there are ways to do that there's uh there's injection systems that use compressed air that yeah. they just that this, it's also used uh, even before biochar was a thing. There were already people doing this to to inject nutrients and to to just loosen up the soil from existing trees by injecting lots of air in multiple spots to to break up whatever compaction is going on. And that's also a way where you can get biochar deeper into the soil with, with injection systems. Wow! Amazing. 
I think there's one company called Vox Geo Injectors or something like that. I saw, I saw that, I saw an advert for it. Actually, there is a big thing, and you never know what's in the make of those kind of adverts. But that is potentially, yeah, the no, way. It, it, it it looks quite legit, and I think that that's a way to go at it. But of course, that's that requires large equipment, and it's not something that's easily scalable. Mm. Brian uh, has had his hand up for a while. I'm going to pass the mic to Brian. Cheers, Brian. Um, yes, uh, Martin, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about wood vinegar? Um, that would be something I'd be very, very interested in. What's in it or what's the, what's the chemical composition of it? And what can you do well, with a <laughs> bit of a... I wish I could tell you exactly what is in it. But the thing is, a wood vinegar. I'm not sure if I'm still sharing my my screen. You are. You are. We've got that. That's okay. brilliant. Okay. So yeah, wood vinegar contains over 200 different organic uh, compounds, and of course, this is going to vary a lot depending on what you make the wood vinegar from. So for example, if you have a wood vinegar made from bamboo or any other like grass or plant that is high in silica, then the wood vinegar is going to be higher in silica as well. And so it's called a vinegar, even though it's not a fermented vinegar, because it does have a high uh, acetic acid content. And so the, the pH is also quite low, it's typically is between 2.5 and 4. So uh, yeah, it's uh, you can use it for so many things. And, and this is also, I think, something that's largely unexplored. And the knowledge that's out there at the moment on wood vinegar is mostly locked away in Asia. So we don't here in the West have that much access to it. Because I know in uh, Indonesia, for example, there are quite a few people producing the stuff. Japan makes it, uh, other Asian countries as well. It's been, it's been a farm input for many, many years there. So you can use it as a growth stimulant, as a germination aid. It's uh, a pest repellent as well. And uh, it's uh, antifungal, antibacterial, and if you use it in stronger concentrations, you can even completely sterilize the soil with it, if that uh, would be needed for whatever reason. And then aside from that, I've seen research that it uh, vastly increases the, the efficiency of, uh, of uh, chemical fertilizers and even uh, conventional pesticides and herbicides, which of course are not things that we like to encourage the use of. But it's interesting that that the wood vinegar seems to enhance the, the properties of other things as well. Wow. And you can make that as a byproduct of uh, exactly. you can make that with 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 the with the charcoal making process and you could capture the heat. So you could get three products from one. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. Wow. Well, uh, ca capturing the heat inside a wood vinegar system gets a bit more complicated because you use most of the heat to to make the smoke that you make the wood vinegar from. Ah, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, you, it, it can all be combined. And personally, uh, I like to, my focus is always to be as efficient as possible. So I don't like burning any biomass down to ashes. So my wood vinegar system is powered by my t lead gasifiers. So either the, the small triple burner or the large uh, 20 liter uh, lead gasifier. So I yeah. use that. I use that as my heat source. Yeah. And with, with that, I heat a retort, and then the smoke that comes out of that retort is being fed through a condensation system, and then there's a, a small amount of remaining uh, volatile components that cannot be condensed, and those can be fed back into the the retort as well to contribute to the heating of the retort. So clever. Mine, I'd love to ask you as well. Like I once um was asked to make a water filter for a friend. Um, you know, charcoal is a great water filter. Yeah. And 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 I and I I read I read a I read a study that said you just boil, you can boil um charcoal three times. It, it's either hydrochloric acid or boiling it. Um and I I I sort of boiled this crushed charcoal three times using the heat from making more charcoal, and it just felt yeah, so yeah. um and yeah, I don't, I just don't, I just, you know, the water, the water filter kind of works, um, but I, well, I, I'm sure it will work. And personally, I'm not sure, entirely sure that the boiling process is strictly necessary, 
Really? Because, because with the boiling, what you're doing essentially is you're activating it. Because that's what yeah. activated charcoal is. It's the porosity is further increased and it increases the absorption capacity of the charcoal. Yeah, but the cation, it, the cation exchange capacity is that it? It's, it's more the internal surface area. But okay. the thing is, if if you're not restricted by space, then you don't really need to go through that step because you can just put more charcoal in a larger container and it's still going to do the filtration. Okay. And and, and there's there's actually product uh, projects that make uh, water filtration systems in the, where they also include uh, biochar. And as far as I'm aware, they don't go through that uh, that activation step. They just make the they make the charcoal and they put it in a system. And they know that a certain quantity of charcoal is good to to filter the water for a certain period of time or for a certain amount of liters. And at the end of that cycle, the charcoal is renewed, uh, and they put new new charcoal in the system. The old charcoal gets get either uh, be burnt to burn some of those contaminations out of it again, or maybe used directly in the soil. Okay, cool. So I guess and yeah. But because you the main thing you've got to make sure is you're not getting too high volatile organic compounds left isn't it so you've got to make it at the right temperature right to... exactly exactly just burn it at, at the hot enough temperature make sure there's no more like and, and would you say what would you say the minimum temperature is for making a biochar that's worth putting into the soil oh uh, well, that's a quite controversial tro topic <laughs> Yeah, there, there's there's I see so many articles come out and studies and then they, they say ah we studied biochar and studied biochar make it 350 degrees Celsius and then I'm thinking to myself is that really biochar or is that just charcoal because at 350 degrees Celsius in my opinion you're not nearly getting all the volatiles out there yeah because it, it's a very low temperature so personally I would say the bare minimum would be 650 700 degrees Celsius. Wow, that's hot. Wow. Yeah, but the thing is, in flame cap kilns, you easily reach that temperature, provided that you use the right type of feedstock. And that's something that I see a lot of people also, they make some mistakes there. They throw massive thick logs onto the flame cap kilns, and a thick log doesn't have that much surface area. So it's it's not going to produce that much heat. And more importantly, it's going to struggle to maintain that flame cap that you need to keep all the oxygen out. Mm. And for that reason, it makes much more sense to, to use much thinner types of wood on, on the flame cap kiln, and that's going to burn incredibly hot. And I've measured temperatures just over a thousand degrees Celsius in flame cap kilns. Wow. Can you do a flame cap kiln with wood chip? No, that's too fine. You can't. And that, that is uh, the, the big limitation of flame cap kilns. It's not suitable for stuff like wood chips. Mm. And if you have, if you're, you're doing a flame cap kiln, you have small amounts of wood chips and you throw in like a handful here, a handful there. Yeah, you can, you can incorporate wood chips in a flame cap kiln, but you cannot run it exclusively on a flame cap kiln. Okay. And the, and the risk is if you throw too much of it on top, then you create like a covering, you're smothering the fire. And then yeah, I know. I've done. I've I've tried to pyrolyze um, various things like oak sawdust and things like that. I can get a lot of that. It does, but it's too fine. I found to 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 you know, smolders and yeah. has really distant burn speeds. Um, yeah, stuff like that is more suitable for like a small retort in a wood stove or uh, maybe a small wood vinegar system. And okay. even in the, even in those in wood vinegar systems and larger retorts, you have to be careful that you don't pack them too dense because you still need to have airflow on the inside of those. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question um, to Martin? Yes, Bono, go for it. Yes. Martin, I, I have a bit the, the problem that you showed in the beginning of your presentation. I'm uh, having a farm in Andalusia, uh, Spain, and I have a very old um, almond and um, olive tree um, forest which yeah. needs a lot of maintenance and I have a lot of cuttings at the moment that yeah. I cannot remove off my field because we are not allowed to make a fire at this moment because it's too dry in that part of Spain and wow. I don't I don't still have too a lot dry of this time yeah it's still dry there yes it's very wow. very dry and I cannot um, I don't have access in the way that I can get uh, material there to 
um, how you call that in English, to merge it, to to make it yeah, in yeah, yeah. small small uh, bits and pieces. So my idea was, when I heard about a biochar, that this might be a very interesting solution um, to my problem in the future when I have like times of wet uh, season, eh? when I yes. have the authority to to burn down my um, my cuttings. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it's such a huge amount that uh, what I saw in your presentations are, um, for me, this is always very new, but the name that you use is knit, knilt, knil? Kill. Kill, yes. So I cannot imagine that I can um, get rid of my cuttings with this small uh, um, sized uh, knils. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I need uh, I need much bigger um, I have a much bigger volume to to um, process. In well, so, so one thing to keep in mind is that as you make biochar from the biomass, it's going to reduce in size by about fifty percent, and then a large pile of biomass. Let me see if I have some pictures. Like here you see a large pile of olive tree prunings. Like mm -hmm. all the biomass you see in the picture, that all disappeared in a single burn. Mm -hmm. Because in, one... in, in this canal, in this canal, in, in front of your picture, you can exactly. burn that in one day. Yes, because the thing yeah. is, a, a, a large pile of biomass like this is it's still mostly air because it's never. Yeah, sure, sure, easy. sure. I understand. Okay, so, so because so, it's mostly air and the biomass reducing by fifty percent, it uh, a large amount fits in a kiln. Mm -hmm. Can I just um I, I, I add a question onto that, Bono? So I love your designs um and seemingly like using old agricultural like buckets and and things that absolutely brilliant permanent designs. Um, we have done um inspired by the University of YouTube just. 200 liter drums with the top cut off um, about we I think it's about 35 centimeter piece cut out a 200 liter drum on its side and sometimes we've embedded it in the earth for like extra kind of insulation and put and and, and that seems to work as as quite well I, I I more use it as my sort of waste uh, flame cap kiln like a you know to get rid of the workshop off cuts and and without putting too much time into it um but having watched your presentation, I want to put more time into preparing the wood so it's all the even size. But like, do you think that that would be adequate, um, or do you think it would lack um, the properties for getting the heat up to plus five six hundred? Well, I, I personally, I think that then a, a pit in the ground would be more suitable, especially if we're talking large quantities of biomass. Right. Because uh, that, of course, depends if the, the soil is suitable for digging a large pit. Like as you as you saw the the picture at the beginning of my presentation, here yeah. in many places you cannot you cannot even dig a, a massive pit, and you have to also be careful if the the subsoil is is rock, uh, if it's like shale or a rock that contains water. You don't want rock starting to explode uh, while you're doing a fire, which I've already had happened uh, a couple times. So you have to be careful with that. But if the soil allows you to dig a large hole and you do really have massive amounts of biomass, then making a, a pit burn is uh, the most efficient way. And okay. Also, also, one benefit of a pit burn over uh, a metal kiln on top of the ground is that you can just you can make the fire bigger than the actual hole itself. Because you, you let it burn, you don't have to process it and cut it smaller. Yeah. And as it burns, you just push it further into the hole. And do you top to do you top light it so you'd make this pit and then you could get a big bonfire going and like I've done in the past you just get the fire going really nicely on top and just let it all burn down. Yeah, yeah, you you always light it on the top because if you start oh, if wait. you light if you light the fire on the bottom you get sure. that whole you get that whole column of heat going through the the column through the biomass yeah. and that starts releasing volatile components smoke which is the mm -hmm. fuel of your fire outside mm -hmm. of the reach of the flame. 
so such a big educational project here like everyone has bonfires and they all light it from the bottom and they all smoke like crazy and exactly. they all everyone's air and it's just so crazy and it's just like have you tried like exactly. and, yeah, well, well, and can i ask something uh, like when is it biochar and when be is it becoming charcoal because i can understand that if you do it in a pit uh, you cannot control uh, the the heat um in the way that you 100 percent sure uh you're for sure no, that it's it's going to process into biochar or is that something well, that, that, that that's a great question and uh, i would definitely say with the pit burn you are reaching the temperatures that would qualify it as biochar okay and, and so in, how they how they made uh, pots and pans in the in the how you call it in english way okay. back Terra preta, the, the the clay. Heat, it's more than thousand degrees uh, Celsius uh, if you oh. burn in a pit, probably. Oh. Well, th that's another thing. You also don't want to get too high in the temperature because if you get much over a thousand degrees, then you start to create more graphite-like structures, which oh. then then becomes less habitable for the microbes and the, the biology of the soil. So yeah. the, the, the sweet spot is really like seven hundred degrees up to nine hundred or so. Can, can you can you control it in a way if you do it in a pit? Can you have like a, a sensor or something to 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 work with? You can always use water, Bono, and you can have some buckets of water to hand, and you can just extinguish it if it's getting too hot. Okay. Well, okay. Well, I don't think it really will get too hot. Like there might be parts of the fire where the fire itself reaches a thousand degrees or over a thousand degrees, but that's not necessarily the part where also the charcoal is located. So I, I would not say, I don't think that getting too hot would be an issue with the flame cap kiln and with that method, but you you do have control over the temperature by the way you feed the fire. Like if you feed it with very, very uh, uh, loose branched material, very thin sticks and stuff, it's going to be hotter. If you give it a bit uh, thicker material, like let's say five, six centimeters uh, diameter sticks, then the, the temperature is going to drop a bit because mm -hmm. there's less active surface area involved in the fire at that time. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it's quite, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to control the temperature of the fire. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I understand. So, so, something else I would like to say, uh, do you know anything about your fire restrictions in relation to barbecues? Like, are you allowed to have barbecues this time of the year? Uh, are you talking to me, Martin, in Spain? Yes, yes. Uh, we are not allowed any fire. Uh, not any fire. Oh, that's that's no. quite. At quite the moment, severe. I have this uh, farm now for three years, and uh, in these three years, uh, also my neighbors uh, they warn me don't uh, make a fire, and we actually need to have an author authorization, uh, and this authorization is only given in the month of uh, January, February. March and the rest of the year, okay. it's not allowed to have any open fire outside. All right, that that's uh, quite quite more restrictive than here in Portugal. Then, yeah, because uh, here the season is a bit longer, but yeah, the yeah there, there's a lot a lot of stress uh, around that at the moment because um, uh, because farmers are not able to get the cuttings of their lands. Um, yeah, they are afraid of uh, of a fire uh, that can uh, occur, and they they happen like in Portugal. Yeah, we have many, we have many fires. <sighs> yeah, it's a it's a big issue. It's so annoying they... because what we need is biochar everywhere to start to help. Exactly the because it, 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 it would create an ecosystem there where the soil holds more water and. More plants start growing. You get more resilience to to. Yeah, I, I also saw those controlled fires that you have, like in the in the United States. They have a lot of experience with the uh, controlled fire uh, uh, management. That they just yeah start the fires uh, like um, uh, how controlled. They they do it themselves, but they have a way of doing it in a way that it's uh, completely. Uh, well, the, the, con the, condition, the conditions need to be right, the wind needs to be right, and yeah. of course the, the people need to be well trained in how to, to operate such a controlled fire. 
Yeah, but sometimes a controlled fire can like actually prevent uh, a, a, fi a real big fire. So that's well, something that, that they don't understand yet uh, in some parts of the world. That, that, well, are... that That's the thing in that the Mediterranean climate here is actually dependent on fires. And lots of mm -hmm. the of the tree species that are growing, especially here in Portugal, we've got lots of pine trees, for example. They need that fire aspect to regenerate mm -hmm. the forest. And you will see after a fire, a lot more young trees will start sprouting. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because because also then the, the seeds get exposed to the heat, the seeds get exposed to the smoke, which is basically the precursor of the, the wood vinegar. And this system needs to have regular fires. And if you have regular fires, you're always going to have smaller fires because the, the fuel doesn't build up. But uh, since we people, we, we do our best to prevent any fire, yeah. then you get a situation where you get such a massive buildup of fuel that if a fire does happen, then the fire goes out of control and you have a massive disaster because the fire is too big for what the system is designed for. Mm -hmm. And and then the fire will actually start killing trees that would otherwise be protected from small fires. Yeah. Like like pine trees, for example, they have such a thick bark because it protects them from those small fires that they they're they're designed for. And same with cork trees. Because cork, for example, is one is a very interesting thing. Cork, as far as I know, is the only material that actually expands and grows. When it uh, when you make biochar with it, so as a cork forest starts burning, the cork layer on the tree actually becomes bigger, and that it insulates the tree even more than it already did, and that pr that protects the tree from from the damage of the fire. Mine. If the fire... my... Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, that... it's okay. Go, go ahead. I was. I just wanted to ask a question about like. Um... It's so inspiring how you're making a living out of this or like at least it's a really great hustle to try and make it you know work as a livelihood for you and um and and i was really inspired by you know your 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 you know your offering to go and do what what did you call them like like you you can do burns for people so like as a service yes. you go and do a biochar burn because because i mean we love doing the stack burners because they're such a lovely way of creating this source of heat and light that's just like better yeah. mm -hmm. than more fire and you manage them a bit and it's just like it's like it's amazing and then it finishes and it's loads of beautiful sparks and just but I, I just wanted to ask a bit of a general question like you know how is it yeah uh, what do you it's like how do you sort of monetize these things like when you when you go to the markets how much do you sell these little bottles of wood wood vinegar how much it's hard uh, to yeah, how much do you do a, a demonstration biochar for a uh, burn for? Like, what's the sort of economy of it? The, well, the wood vinegar starts at five euros for the small bottle I have here. Yeah. Our, our latest is 50 milliliters. Yeah. And of course, if you use it for, for germinating seeds and stuff, because the dilution is so large, you dilute it one to 200. So a small bottle is gonna gonna last you quite long if you use it for for uh, germinating seeds. And right. we have we have la larger bottles as well. We have a two hundred fifty ml bottle that goes for twelve euros at the moment. Okay. And then, cool. and then, then we have a seven hundred and fifty milliliter bottle which goes for thirty euros currently. Yeah, and and the price of charcoal of, of your good your high grade char do you, do you sell that or do you just use? Uh, it? Well, the the tooth powder, for example, that's a bit more uh, is more expensive compared to the one that goes into the soil. There's a lot more work co goes into it to make it, and it's made from hemp. Uh, the the whole processing of it is more more involved and more elaborate. We have to we have to grind it in a different way. We have to screen it to make sure it's super fine. And that one goes for we have uh, ten gram bags that goes for nine euros, and we have five gram jars that goes for five euros. And cool. Then, then our smoked salt, for example, goes for. Let's see, at that. So the smoked salt is the we have ten a uh, hundred gram pouches. Yeah. They they go for three euros. And then we have the, the 150 gram jar that is five euros. 
and, wow. and this is something this is like it's a great conversation starter and often like people pass by and they they seem completely uninterested but yeah then if you ask like have you ever tried smoked salt i love that you get them by this yeah. something they can experience rather than just some more information it, they don't know yeah it, it, exactly and then they try it and they, oh like oh this is nice yeah i'll, I'll have one or no i'll take three uh because they want to give some to their friends as well so yeah that's, uh, that's that's that worked great at markets absolutely brilliant and your and your private biochar burns do are they like i guess you do them various prices depending on who what the budget of the person is no, no they they have a fixed price but uh, okay i'm sorry so we have the private burn and you can fit the the the, the 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 barrel in your car kind of thing and just take it to people and do it yeah that's uh the kiln we currently use actually it fits in our car uh, it's not a, it's not a huge car but the kiln fits and also the kiln is big enough it makes a, it makes a substantial amount of biochar and i've had people that i made biochar for and then i speak them uh, i talk to them more than a year later and they still say i still have loads then i ask them did you start making biochar yourself and say no because i still have loads from from when you were here and made, made the biochar so right. uh the big kiln we're currently using the website we need to update a bit because so it's 300 it's pound plus travel that's amazing and then they get mm -hmm. to keep biochar you just take responsibility uh, for it like you make sure you know it's all safe and you've got like uh, uh, exactly yeah. and and they keep all the biochar so that, that's why the price is at that point as well. so they they supply the wood so they have to you have they have to have the, the yeah drive. yeah yeah they they need to supply the the biomass because otherwise also that's the thing with with making biochar if you start to have uh if you start to have to move the biomass all over the place then it becomes such a hassle and that's why having a mobile kiln is also so important and that's also a reason why having a kiln is more beneficial than always using a hole in the ground for example yeah exactly let, 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 let's say you have a, a farm that's a couple of hectares then if you would have to dig so many holes to not have to drag all that biomass around, then it makes more sense to have a mobile kiln. You can just take the kiln from, from pile to pile. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. interested. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, oh. and, and I, I'm, I'm open to doing workshops in other countries as well. well obviously, I will not be able to, to take the, the kiln in the plane, but surely we will be able to find the solution for that that's necessary yeah i mean it could include making a kiln on site couldn't it it's just like we could just find the right kind of metal here and you could come make it oh well, yeah if you have the steel and you have uh, have a stick welder then i can uh, i can weld the kiln together because i do all my own welding so well um i have a quick question who's that yes Jessica. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to um, put your video on? Oh, yeah. Hello. Awesome. Welcome Hi. Back. Hi. Um, if we were thinking about using pallet wood, wood from pallets, do we have yeah. to be careful about whether they've been treated chemically? Uh... And also the same kind of question for Christmas trees that have been like sprayed a lot. Um, with pesticides would you need to worry about that it all depends on what exactly they've been sprayed with yeah because uh, uh, the thing is a lot of pesticides and for example glyphosate for example that completely disintegrates into its base components at a temperature less than 200 degrees celsius so that's not something where you would have to worry about that if it's a if it's a chemical that contains like arsenic, yeah, then we have to be careful and we should not be using that to make biochar for growing food, for example. Okay. But uh, w when it comes to pellets, I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but here in Portugal, this is I'm in the Netherlands. Ah, you're in the Netherlands, which I guess would be similar to here in Portugal as well. Yeah. Because here in Portugal, I've I've handled definitely a few hundreds of pellets and the amount of pellets I've encountered that have been treated with methyl bromide is literally like two or three pellets because they're, they've been phased out in like so many years ago they've been banned in Europe that it's yeah. very difficult to encounter those they're mostly but, heat treated now aren't they Please. Yeah, every, all the pellets seem to be heat treated and 
then of course you have to make sure you get it from a source where it's where they don't spill any other chemicals on top of them. But personally, uh, I would say that is also very rare. Most most pellets I encounter that they look clean, that don't look like stuff has been spilled onto them. And, and even if, for example, maybe you get pellets from like a car dealer or something, they have some some motor oil that's spilled onto it. That's all stuff that's going to completely burn in in the heat of the fire as well. Okay, thank so you. That's, that's definitely an input you can use. It's, it's just that the nails can be a bit annoying. Absolutely. On that vein, can I ask Martin, what's your thoughts on um, like a lot of the waste wood that one can acquire has, has often got like, you know, a bit of plywood um, and and even tiny amounts of MDF. I've I've had a bonfire, I've had a biochar fire with what I would not use in the soil. I used it as like aggregate biochar, like biochar that I was just going to put into like, you know, in, underneath a pathway kind of thing rather than in contact yeah. with, because it was like way too much MDF. But like, if I've got like 5% um, plywood bits and MDF, I might chop it up and add it to a, a burn that ends up in compost. Would you say that is like acceptable or what? I mean, have you, because I mean, there's some people on the internet that are like, absolutely no, do not put that anywhere near your biochar. But at the same time, I'm thinking what well, we're composting, microorganisms are going to make that into habitat regardless. Um, well, I, I think a lot of the glues in, in plywood and stuff like that, they, might, they, they will burn also. They, they completely disintegrate into their base components. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. But no, so, and you're talking about the structure being not conducive to fungal habitat, et cetera, but it's... It's if it's as I'm I don't know I'm my feeling is if it's as if it's under five percent then it's going to you know that we can't we can't throw away that we you know where else are those where else well, is yeah, we have to put it somewhere like, exactly. yeah we, we we can we can divert it all to landfill but uh, yeah personally for for my private garden I do sometimes include some some plywood as well mm -hmm. like, because I burn everything so hot and. Like when I do a, a flame cap uh, burn, there is maybe just one or two handfuls of material that have not carbonized all the way through. And those are set aside and add to the next burn. And everything is fully carbonized. And, and for my private garden, I have no issues of including small amounts of of such woods. Because yeah. like the, the, the fungi and everything that's going to inoculate the char at some point is all going to gonna deal with it and also any contamination that might be there it's tightly bound into that carbon structure yeah because for, for them to even test the presence of certain things they expose the biochar to all kinds of acids to make that extraction and then we have to wonder if in nature those things would actually leach from the char or if they just stay bound up in the charcoal itself good point yeah Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Nev, Jack, Joanna, Elizabeth? No worries if not. But what not not often you get to ask a question to someone that's knowledgeable about charcoal. About biochar. See, I see someone just raised their hand. Oh cool. Where are they? Joanna raised her hand. Great just disappeared i'm just trying to un unmute myself i just wanted to know are you beginning to have an impact on the, the farmers around you in them burning as well are you seeing a, a, well, a change that, <laughs> in people's that's a that's a difficult question uh, i try to not convince the local farmers here to change their ways because a lot of them are more of the, the elderly generation uh, and it's it's not easy for people of a certain age to have to to realize that the way they've been doing things for many many years, and the way their fathers and grandfathers have been doing things, are not the best way to do things. Mm. So, so I I just do I just do my thing, and then yeah, if it inspires people, then that's great. But I I'm not trying to convince people in particular. Mm. You've got everything to make a kind of course here, like a crash course in biochar. Yeah. <laughs> so good. You've really you've got your own little school right here. I'd love to come and like 
you know help you make a course or something because i know that you you were saying you're not the kind of person that can video some of us like you know it's it's painful to have to like film ourselves as well as doing this work isn't it um yeah but honestly like what you're doing is so so good and it's so excess you know in many ways you just yeah you do i, I want you to have your, like your bio biochar school a module in a course a curriculum that could just get make this go further because it's such good accessible influential work thank you very much for your yes. compliments there <laughs> um any other questions everyone if if um if that's if that's all then i would just like to encourage everyone to join the biochar group on the forum because that is like the most um it's got the most engagement on the forum of all the groups um that in the mycology space with and I, i'm looking to like upgrade the forum so we can have like moderators like um like brian and martin and the earthly guys and caroline i'd love it if you would be moderators in the biochar space and like i realized that like kind of can't do this you can't do a network it's greater than the sum of its parts on your own i i need to find a way of like structuring it so that it like it would incentivize you guys to use it too um and you know potentially if we can like get lot you know at the moment it's just a fledgling little like community but if we could get lots of members there could be a way that like they could benefit um our different projects and our different livelihoods by a bit like you know youtube but on a smaller scale like you know the the more engaged con you know the more the more you put in the more you get out basically it can incentivize it can work for uh, us all so i'm i'm going to sort of like develop that idea and be in touch with people about that in different subjects because i think that's the way it could really take off and and, and we're, we're we're working on like educational tutorials because it's actually really useful if you just go on there now and just put in i could, I could do a whole talk i think i'm going to save it for a separate video to focus on that I'm sure we're all tired now but like hashtags just search the hashtags like that you're interested in and you'll find some really great information that's been shared there over the last few years um so yeah um that's another chapter but yes do, do 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 join the biochar group um to keep in touch with martin as well hopefully um, um I, i'll i hope to see you there and i'll probably be sharing a lot of your catching a lot of your biochar inspiration and putting it there regardless but um yes thanks everyone thank you martin thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you bye bye everyone good evening bye